listening to Overwatch League Daily, your daily source for Overwatch League news, scores, and more. Here's your host, Kicked Tripod. Hey, good morning, Overwatch League fans, and welcome to your Overwatch League Daily episode for April 5th, 2018. We've got a long one for you today, so buckle up. I'm going to go through the news and signings and score as fast as we can so I can get into my interview with Pixie about last night's games. But first, uh, we do have news. Yesterday morning, the Overwatch League announced the all-access pass on Twitch. So, obviously, the first question is, well, what do you get? Let's talk about Command Center first. This is the first big perk. It includes a primary feed, a secondary feed with alternate in-game camera angles, backstage camera camera views, player POVs, and stats, map scores, and standings. It's kind of like a multi-screen experience on one screen. Uh, Make sure to check it out. I'm going to go into it in a second, but it's free right now. You also get exclusive behind-the-scene VODs and access to a weekly series called Behind the Screens, sorry, where an Overwatch League player will break down and analyze a particular uh, match or game. So uh, that's something that you get there. You also get match day AMAs where pass holders can submit questions and uh, command center behind the scenes and match day AMAs are free to everyone through May 15th. You also get ad-free watching on Twitch, a subscriber-only chat room on Twitch, a subscription icon For Twitch, you get 23 Twitch emotes, which are a combination of golden logos for teams in the league and some, you know, cute character emotes. You also get an in-game Overwatch League skin for Soldier 76, McCree, and Moira, and an in-game Overwatch League spray and player icon. So how much is this going to cost you? Uh, $29.99, unless you're a Twitch Prime member and you sign up before April 12th. Uh, you can get it for $19.99. So make sure to check that out. At least go and watch it on twitch.tv slash Overwatch League. See if it's something that's for you and, and adds to your experience. Also in the news, EQO of the Philadelphia Fusion has been fined $1,000 by the league front office for making racially insensitive gestures on his personal Twitch stream. In addition to this, the Fusion front office have suspended EQO for three games, issued an additional fine of $2,000, and has had his streaming privileges revoked until June 17th. EQO will also be donating $3,000 to the Anti-Defamation League, League's No Place for Hate campaign, and the Fusion are going to match his fine and donation for a total of $10,000 to the organization. In other words, or sorry, in other news, uh, you thought that we were done with signings. We're not. (laughs) There's more. The Shanghai Dragons have picked up DPS player Damon, a player who spent 2018 with, or sorry, uh, 2017 with Rox Orcas and Kongduancia before being signed by NRG Esports, the San Francisco Shocks Contenders Academy team. He played for the Shanghai squad yesterday evening. So we'll definitely be uh, talking about his debut probably later on in the week. The LA Valiant made two pickups yesterday and teased a third. KSF Flex DPS, formerly of Simplicity, and you guys get paid. And Finzi Flex Tank for Orglis and Hungry. One, two, three, and Mavi Star Riders have joined the squad. I don't have an exact date for when we're going to see them, but as soon as we find out, I'll make sure to let you know. And lastly, the LA Valiant teased a 12th player signing, and that is based on the image that they, uh, the LA Valiant Twitter tweet teased. And reports from Slasher, it seems that the final addition to the Valiant roster is NC Fox's flex support, Izayaki. Sorry about that. Uh, the pronunciation will let you know as soon as it's confirmed, but this, this one's pretty likely. Otherwise, we uh, wouldn't be talking about it on this show. That's it for the news. Let's go to your scoreboard brought to you by patreon.com slash OWL daily show and the patrons and supporters there. If you like the show, consider stopping by and supporting for the first map match. Sorry of the stage. We had the Shanghai dragons taking on the Dallas fuel. This one was Dallas. They would take down the dragons three to one 
The LA Valiant would sweep the Seoul Dynasty four maps to zero, and the San Francisco Shock would take a decisive victory over the Gladiators three maps to one. That's it for your scoreboard. Let's jump into my interview with Pixie about yesterday's matches. All right, I am here with Matt Pixie Carroll. He's been on the show many a times. Uh, <laughs> I almost threw you under the bus for the comment I always make fun of you for, but I did oh. it. I did it. Uh, <laughs> Pixie, man, it's good. It's good to finally do this live. Yeah, uh, nice to uh, nice to be here. Have you have to see all this pre makeup routine? Jeez, I see. I at least. T- you had the courtesy to put on my makeup, but anyways, you look <laughs> just, good, John. I'm just kidding. It's, it's all natural. Anyways, let's <laughs> talk about these games. We're first day of uh, stage three is in the books and pretty exciting. We got a new PVE announcement from uh, Jeff Kaplan's. So that was kind of cool, but we also saw a lot of teams that made a lot of moves in uh, the off season here or pre inter stage signing window type thing. And the first one is we're going to talk about is the fuel versus the dragons. Uh, This was a totally different look that we've seen from the dragons than in the past, right? We had five players. If I counted right at one point, all who had not been on the stage together before. Uh, So let's talk first. Let's hit the highlights. What went well for this team uh, despite uh, going going uh, one and three, um, that's that's kind of a tricky one because to talk about what went well, I've probably actually got to touch on what was going wrong because the thing that went well was them uh, then changing up what was going wrong, right, and like actually fixing things and addressing things throughout the series, uh, like. On the whole, um, I want to say, look, Dragons, they got stopped up a lot. They didn't seem particularly proactive a lot of times. They also weren't very quick uh, when they were being reactive. This was at its worst on Elios, namely Lighthouse. Fuel were just getting a run around on Dragons all the time. And a lot of that just kind of looks communication related. Um, it's not to say that the communication is like bad, but the roster, like you noted, a lot of changes, and this is their first showing. Like it's totally normal to have some kinks in the communication. That's just that's always going to be the case, right? And I do expect to see that to change as the season goes on. And we already saw that a bit over the series, that kind of improvement I was talking about. That's what ultimately went well. And we started to see that come to its fullest fruition on Junker Town. It's kind of obvious to say because they won Junker Town but they won it by actually being the more proactive of the two teams, generally speaking. And it was enough to sort of anchor the defense very firmly on point B. Like that was where it was at its strongest. And it was enough to take a map off of fuel. And you've got to consider uh, maybe if that had been present throughout the rest of the series, it may have been enough to take those maps off. You know, it may be enough to actually pick up series wins when this team is kind of going well. That being said, though, there were, there were some other kind of things going on there and then it's also hard to say whether playing to that level was you know just enough to beat fuel whether it then also be enough to beat um say even a team like uprising or outlaws and all that you know that that sort of the rest that middle of the pack team and that's where the test is really going to come i think for dragons in terms of um how much effect these roster changes have had and their upward mobility also in terms of major issues they looked vastly unprepared for Sombra. It's kind of this two-pronged thing, right? Because the issues they were having with playing reactively and also being proactive in their own right were exacerbated by there being a Sombra, uh, but also the Sombra was able to take advantage of those issues, right? So it's 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 sort of this knock-on effect, right? Where one propagates the other. And on the whole, it looks like they're just getting completely torn to bits by a single hero pick. And it's not completely true. That's not exactly what's going on. But they certainly weren't ready enough for Sombra. And with the other issues they were having, it just looked very compounded. One caveat I will add to all of this, because, uh, you know, the, the, the Fuel did win. And, you know, Shanghai had some shining moments, especially towards the end, as, as you talked about. But... Uh, it is worth noting that both Taimu and Rascal were out for this one too. So we didn't necessarily see every look that we could have seen from the fuel, um, which yeah. I, I don't want to speculate too much on 
would it have been a 4L? Would it have been worse? Would it have been better? But uh, it, it is something worth noting, and I didn't mention it at the beginning of the show, so it's definitely worth bringing up. But here's here's the big question. This is what I want to know, is Shanghai. This is We'll call it Shanghai 2.0. Based on what we saw today, are are you optimistic that this team is is going to be better, more well equipped to compete in Overwatch League than Shanghai 1.0? Uh, I'm going to say uh, yes unequivocally, and actually, I do just want to touch on something something you mentioned a moment ago in terms of the Fuels roster because sure. I think that is quite a fair point. Like we we there may be a slightly better version of the Fuel that could have four o'd today. But I think the moment we enter that speculative territory, and this is going to link into what I'm about to say about the Dragons, we then also have to consider, well, what if they actually played this match in a month's time, you know, and the Dragons have had a bit more time with this roster to kind of gel things together. Would that be a 4-0 in Dragons' favor? Or, like, the moment we enter that speculative speculative territory, those are the other sorts of things we have to consider. And the reason I think that's worth actually considering is, uh, you know, like I said, I think Shanghai... 2.0, 2.0, as you put it, are on the whole looking better. They were still looking a little bit outclassed in some head-to-head situations, but honestly, I chalked this up to the same coordination and communication issues that I was talking about a moment ago. They're not being just generally outclassed anymore, and that's good, right? What we saw today was a, a, a team that was better than Shanghai 1.0 playing worse than Shanghai 1.0 at their best, right? And and that's, that's a good thing, right? Because that means they can start to pick up. You're like, imagine they have that same amount of time under their belt that the previous Shanghai roster, sort of its, its main uh, incarnation, got to have together. And I think we could be seeing a very different thing, right? Uh, I don't know that that makes them playoffs caliber. Let's not go nuts. But uh, long term, I think this is a team that really starts to push the rest of those bottom half teams like Fuel and also to that end like Shock and Mayhem, which changes things uh, just throughout that bottom... Um, strata if you will of the standings uh the other teams that have been able to kind of get away with bouncing around that area picking up the odd one here or there knowing that they won't finish last because shanghai kind of occupied that spot uh, like that's that's not going to be the case anymore the moment shanghai start you know really challenging these teams you know taking maps taking full series off them indeed and i do expect this to be the stage where shanghai takes some series of teams fuel stood as a good opportunity for them to do so unfortunately that one has passed them by thanks to some things not being perfectly clean but i imagine a much cleaner looking roster could be taking um you know maybe off someone like mayhem or off shock uh, there there are certainly other opportunities for them to pick up series wins or indeed extremely close losses and the moment that starts happening the rest of these teams find themselves in this situation where there's no more excuses right if you're losing you know, like you're picking up some wins here and there, you're losing here and there, but you're always ahead of Shanghai. That much is sure. The <laughs> moment that changes, those teams have to accept that something's not going right for them. And I think a lot of them already have. They're already trying to make those changes. But there is also this real threat that they may not be enough. That's always going to be a factor. So I think that's actually something that a lot of these teams are going to have to face. And it's something that Shanghai just spent the last two stages facing and are now better for it. And another thing worth noting, too, is we we didn't have Dia at all, uh, and he'll be coming back, too. So this might not even be the best version of the Shanghai Dragons as well. So uh, optimistic overall. And if you've listened to the show in the past, you know that we usually don't like talking about players debuts after just one game because it or one match, because it's 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 a lot of times it's it's unfair. So for those wondering, well, what about Gregory? What about? Uh, these other players, uh, we will definitely talk about them more in depth, but not today. Yeah. Let's talk about the Valiant yeah. versus the Dynasty. And uh, this one was, I, I want to say surprising, but I also want to say not surprising. Because if you look at the past between these two teams, end of stage one, you had the Valiant 3-0, the Dynasty, who played kind of a, a pseudo lineup of the of their best players and then the first week of stage two they they spun around and we kind of saw the uh the primary uh squad from soul and they 4 owed the valiant and uh, if anything we've seen something from soul where they tend to drop maps and even entire matches from teams that they shouldn't necessarily 
lose to. And sometimes it's uh, different personnel. Sometimes it's just sloppy play. But what happened with this one here, Pixie? Yeah, uh, that's that's a pretty good point. Uh, Soul kind of do have the odd match where they're just like, eh. Uh, <laughs> I also don't want to. I don't want to consider too much of the history between these two teams when I look at this match today. Valiant because is totally different. There was, yeah, yeah. Valiant is completely different, but also I think Soul played uh, just a lot worse. Uh, than what they have even the first time they met Valiant, where they got 3 0 by them. I think Wasn't enough about close. this was, yeah, enough about this was different just on the day that I think we can honestly disregard the last two results between the two teams. Look, uh, back to the, the notion of Seoul kind of having those those weird question mark performances. Like they had it a couple of times in stage one, uh, like they nearly lost to Shock. Um, it never quite seems to last the whole series, though. And they do tend to eke out a win, which has been enough for them to stick around that kind of top four. But you also have to consider that, you know, losing a couple of maps where maybe they could be a team that 4 O's and not doing so was enough to exempt them from playoffs in stage two. Something that Philadelphia got over them based purely off math differential. Philadelphia, a team that they had beaten in their own right. So it's already kind of bitten soul, like this, this sort of consistency thing here. And I think this is at its like most extreme, right? Traditionally, soul not making playoffs has been due to not quite measuring up to the teams that did make playoffs, or at least were, you know, above them. And, and generally speaking, they've only lost to teams that have, um, that have, like I said, made playoffs or in their own right been muscled out of playoffs, with Philly being the only exception to that. If you want to extrapolate history, that suggests that Valiant is a playoffs team now. But if you watch the match, you'd realize Seoul really just played that bad. And and, there's and, no and two just ways to clarify, I don't want to cut you out, 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 but are you talking about stage playoffs or season playoffs? Stage playoffs here, stage playoffs. Yeah. Okay. Just looking looking more historically speaking, yeah. Um, look, today the coordination was sloppy. The execution was lacking. The decision-making wasn't tidy. Are they still a playoffs caliber team? Look, maybe, but you've also got to consider that, you know, manifestations of these same issues, albeit in less extreme forms, has, over the last two stages, exempted this otherwise very high caliber team from playoffs. And, and I think, if anything, this serves as a massive kick in the pants for Seoul. And I think a deserved one. We can no longer look at this team and go, oh, man, this great team just barely fell short. Gee golly, isn't that a shame? We've got to look at it and go, you, you can do better. You should be doing better. And you're not. You've got to address that. Yeah, the first couple of, of losses, especially, where, where we saw Seoul start to strip uh, slip a little bit, we... Uh, it, it was very easy to go, you know, well, that's not l the lunatic high we know. And that's, you know, that just wasn't yeah. characteristic of them. And they could kind of float on through that on the names. But there comes a point yeah. where you miss playoffs two stages in a row. Uh, you you lose matches and you lose maps to teams that you shouldn't necessarily. And there's some, you know, uh, which is going to lead into my next question. Because uh, because there's some question about the team strategy, yeah. especially against some of these top top of the mid tier teams, the ones that you know used to uh, th that Soul is having to compete with now. You used to think of them kind of head and shoulders above with uh, the NYXL and the Spitfire, and now you're looking at them and go, are they are they much better than a, a Valiant or a uh, <clears throat> last stage of Gladiators or or, or whatever yeah. or an Uprising? And, and and actually, just to jump on something you kind of mentioned there, because I think you bring up a really important note of being that this team is is still essentially uh, lunatic high. And I think uh, I, I, I definitely mentioned this uh, even going into uh, the first stage of Overwatch League. We also have to look at lunatic high as well and say that, like, by the time we were approaching the end of their run, they weren't the best team in Korea. Let's let's not beat about the bush with that. There were some teams having very strong performances. They were even even stagnating in some ways. I don't want to go too much into detail because this is also, you know, this is now a different time and patch, and you know, a lot has changed since then. But right. you know, I think going into it, I think a lot of people were still kind of drinking the lunatic high Kool Aid of the Apex season, where they were unequivocally the best. And by the time Overwatch League itself had begun. Those days were well enough in the past. Like there was already GC Busan, who then got picked up by Spitfire uh, and and a lot of other Apex teams. You know, really 
really kind of pushing that that envelope and lunatic high were no longer top dog and i think maybe soul were actually allowed an amount of prestige that they potentially hadn't earned yet i would say now that they have earned that prestige by at least actually finishing within that top half of the of the bracket at all times but if you want to draw the connection now back to lunatic high by the time they finished their run, they were not winning Apex. They were not the playoffs team that they had been when they were winning Apex, and that is now the same still for Salt. They have not recovered from Lunatic High's, I don't want to say decline, because it's not like they bottomed out, but certainly being surpassed by other Korean teams. Yeah, at the they, they plateaued the at Busan. the very least, maybe even dipped yes. down, while other teams caught up and even surpassed. Definitely yeah. happened. I want to really quick, I want to ask you something because we see this every time. Every time Seoul loses a a match, we see a community reach out for explanations. And one of the first ones that they go to, one of the first ones, the knee-jerk reaction is to blame the player lineup. We didn't see Jaehong or Toby. People are, Are people justified to blame a player lineup in a situation like this? Do you think they're misplacing the blame is is there only a small fraction of 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 that going there and i know i'm asking you to read it into a crystal ball a little bit but but i'd love (laughs) to hear your opinion uh from what you uh, see as as an analyst in overwatch my look the the real answer to this are those people justified a little bit of yes and a massive lot of no the answer i would like to give and i try to give in all situations is um, flatly no, because I don't want these sorts of people to even begin to consider that it is ever worthwhile blaming blaming a player. I have, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna commit to this. I have never in my entire time uh, watching esports, casting esports, being involved in esports, seen a match where I could blame a singular player or even you know a pair of players for a team's loss, not once. And it never will happen unless someone turns up with like a broken hand and literally cannot operate their mouse. Then, maybe then, I could blame it on a player. But even then, I would actually blame it on the player's injury. So, look, Mm. an uncoordinated team will always lose to a coordinated one. It is rare that individual skill is high enough compared to one's opponent to claw back a victory despite poor team play. It is especially rare for this to happen at the highest level of professional Overwatch, which is what Overwatch League is. Ryu Jihong is a great player and a massive asset to this team, but that makes it way too easy to drink the Kool-Aid and attribute all success to him and all failure to his absence, if that's a factor. But that's dishonest. And I think the people making that argument of, well, if they'd had Ryu Jihong, and I think those people really know that that's a dishonest argument as well because you've already said it yourself this team has lost with Rio Jahong they've won without him uh, he and Toby look they are not the be all end all of this team and it is ludicrous to consider it as such that's why this this whole notion of blaming players really bothers me the unfortunate thing though is there is that tiny bit of yes and that tiny bit of yes is as follows had Rio Jahong been in this match I think what we would have seen is like a few more deaths on soon but ultimately the same result. And that's the thing. We could have looked at it and gone, despite the loss, Ryu Jahong still performed really well. Therefore, it's not his fault they lost. And of course, that's going to be the case. Ryu Jahong is a great player. He always performs well, even in the face of defeat. But the defeat still happened. That's still a team issue. And the absence of Ryu Jahong or the existence of him in a, a match where a defeat is had has nothing to do with him. Wow. I am. I'm inspired. I want to like wave a <laughs> Overwatch League flag around here right now. This is why we got to do these live more often. Um, we we originally were going to talk about uh, space and Custa and agilities and, and how they performed. Uh, but let's let's jump past that for a second. Let's just talk about <laughs> sure, Valiant sure. 2.0. This is the first yeah. look at Valiant 2.0. We got Shanghai 2.0. Even more so is Valiant 2.0. Uh, overall opinions, they, they come out the gate. I, I mean, Space, for, for me, I was really impressed with his debut. But overall, Valiant 2.0, is this, are we back to stage one LA Valiant where they're challenging, really challenging and can challenge these Korean teams and other top teams in Overwatch League? Yeah, this is really tricky, right? Uh, I think I think we can we can lambast Soul's performance, and I think rightfully so. But I think on the other hand, we can say to an extent, "Welcome back, Valiant." 
uh, today they were at least good enough to exploit Soul's weaknesses and play a cleaner match than Soul. Whether that means they can play cleaner versus Fusion or Uprising the Outlaws or like even, you know, as you mentioned, the Korean rosters like NYXL and Spitfire is another thing altogether, but the signs are there. This won't be the same Valiant we saw in Stage 2 unless they are still having consistency issues and we just haven't seen enough matches to happen. I'm hopeful, and I think a lot of people would like to see them return to their Stage 1 caliber, but I'm also realistic. Because in the time it has taken them to achieve this performance today, which, remember, is only their first of Stage 3, the slow-burn, high-ceiling teams like Fusion have already overtaken them, right? Uh, you know, I think a lot of... There, there were a number of people that pinned those sorts of teams like Fusion and also, to a lesser extent, Uprising as being like, yeah, there's a lot of bits here, they're going to take a time, you know, take a bit of time to really start firing on all cylinders. Uh, Valiant were never put in that box because it wasn't like, um, well, I, actually, they, they weren't put in that box because they didn't deserve to be in that box. They were always going to play as well as they were on any given day, right? And and it's like there was never going to be this concept with them of just wait until they are, you know, fully realized. Um, they they kind of are what they are. I know that sounds really, uh, really <laughs> bleedingly obvious, but but I mean, it's it's. It's right there in the standings yeah. if you want to go and look at them, right? You know, Valiant, you know, when when they were the, the fifth best team, they finished fifth, or rather fourth, actually. Uh, when they weren't, they finished lower down. And you compare that to uh, that other sort of, that other category of teams, the ones that actually are more mobile in the standings, um, sort of as time has gone by, when they've sort of slowly improved you know, it's a very different kind of thing. It's a very different trajectory. And I don't think Valiant is necessarily one of those teams. I don't think they're going to have, you know, a two stages later, they're suddenly making playoffs kind of thing like what Philadelphia Fusion have just done. But certainly I can see them returning to the stage one. Yeah, we'll really push the envelope here. From there, they can start making the marginal improvements that maybe push them into playoffs. But like I said, they uh, they're not necessarily uh, in the ideal position to do that because of what happened in stage two. Like I said, they have to return to that point before they can start pushing the envelope once again. And all of these other teams have you know spent the entirety of stage two tooling up and and improving. And those that haven't have spent the off season doing so. Like Valiant are very much behind the eight ball. It's going to be very very hard to get back in front of it because not only do they have to get back past teams like Outlaws uprising fusion they also have teams like mayhem and shock and dragons now hot on their heels yeah the teams across the board are getting better and we're seeing the valiant almost have to start from scratch here a little bit yeah and they've got to rebuild i will say this using an eye test and again this match finished a couple hours ago so i'm going to go on the eye test here and say i saw some of the most impressive team play from the Valiant that I that I can remember so far in Overwatch League. Uh, and I will say mainly around soon and space. I, I'm going to probably just do a whole video about it one time because it, it was fascinating to watch. And I was sitting in Discord with uh, like Volamel and Yiska and Sideshow and we were talking about it. And, and, and it was something that kept coming up. You kept seeing these, these sparks of synergy that they didn't yeah. necessarily have. And maybe it had to do with some of the um, language barriers from from players who have come and gone, uh, especially in that diva role. Okay, I'll say envy. Maybe envy with the rest of the team. Maybe not. I, I can't say for sure. But it was it was a really promising look from the Valiant. Yeah. Where I, I kind of yeah, looked at them. There's something going on there. It didn't feel like what we saw in stage one. You're like, wow, that's the Valiant performing at their best. Uh, it was like, wow, the Valiant are performing really well. Uh, and they they could probably even do better, and that's yeah. a really exciting thing uh, when when you look at the Valiant right now. And, and if you're a Valiant and, and fan, that's, yeah, that's get, that's just for what it's worth. Like that is the sort of thing that I I see actually being uh, what helps push them back up to their stage one level. Had this been something that we were seeing in them in stage one, we would have talked about stage two being a point where they want to push beyond that level. But but like this is why I say I think they can return to that stage one level and not push past it just yet, rather than saying, no, I think it's too late. Everyone else is improving at the same rate. Because there are those those sparks there that should become something more. Should. I like that. <laughs> After a conversation about the 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 Soul Dynasty. Should doesn't always mean will. <laughs> and uh, we, we've learned that yeah. too much now in Overwatch League. We need to talk about the Shock versus the Gladiators. And, and we need to talk about 
uh, one thing in particular, and I'm going to break. I'm going to break an Overwatch League daily rule, and we're going to talk about a player after their first uh, their first stint in Overwatch League, and that's super super. Yeah. Uh, the reason why I want to talk about this is because we don't have a whole lot to go off of in his past. This is essentially day one of Super's professional career in most cases, unless you watch, you know, whatever stream, if you got some access to scrims, stuff like that. Broad question here. How, how did Super do? Did he impress you in his debut? Yeah. Sort of a man of mystery, isn't he? But yeah, he did. He did well. Um, it was, he was an important part of Shock's performance today, I'll say that. Um, but I, I think it's important for us to not get too excited about this, right? Um, and this is actually going to link back a little bit to what I was talking about before with regards to Rio Jahong and, and, you know, blaming players. But I'll get to that in a moment. I'll get to how that relates to Super. Shock are not out of the woods yet, right? And it would be all too easy for people to turn on Super the moment things go even just a little bit wrong, right? He's, he's new. His first showing was good. His consistency is untested. That's what we have to remember here. As far as his part in the victory today goes, it's also important to turn our attention to, to, you know, Moth and the general improvements of the team as a whole. And it's also important to recognize Gladiator's shortcomings and and their um, impact on the series and it's turning into a shock victory. But yeah, I I kind of want to, you know, not to harp on about it too much, but like, I want want people to... um, I want people to stay cool-headed when they look at Super and when they talk about Super. I think it's very important to celebrate the successes and the wins and his part in them. Uh, but I think it's very easy to um, to kind of over-examine players, especially uh, new additions to rosters, young players. And when you've got a guy like Super, who is the crossroads of those two, I think it's really, really easy to attribute too much to one guy. Um, because I didn't see anything in particular out of Super. Look, he's, he's a, he seemed just like a, a, a good fit and something that is helping Shock push the level upwards, but he is not some sole proponent of that. And if they lose, he is not going to be the sole proponent of that loss as well. Again, unless he turns up with a broken hand and literally can't operate his mouth, his mouth, his mouse, and was too stupid and stubborn to say, I should sit this one out, then yeah, sure, maybe I'll blame the one guy, but that is never going to happen. If it does, I'll eat a shoe. <laughs> you would, somebody write that down. Save the clip <laughs> for me. I need to ask you one last question before we get out of here. And people are getting an extra long episode of Overwatch League Daily today because we 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 missed one last week. So you know we'll go a little bit longer here. Leaving stage two, the Gladiators uh, had amassed a great amount of momentum. We'll say. And uh, I think a lot of people were hoping or expecting it to carry into stage three. On the flip side, we saw San Francisco shock where the results hadn't necessarily had a lot of momentum, but you had Sinatra coming off. You've got the signing of Moth and Architect and then Super is eligible right away. So you've got a lot to be hopeful for. Are we seeing in in this particular point in time just a point i'm saying take a trend from a point i know it's it's not necessarily the wisest thing to do but are we seeing a gladiators team that's maybe on a a bit of decline or a plateau or are we seeing a shock squad that's on the rise and can maybe compete with some of those bottom teams in the top six that that kind of really tight race between uh, the, the third and, and sixth, seventh place teams. Um, I think we can say one of those things. Um, and and I actually think for what it's worth, this is one of the few times where we can kind of look at a singular point and uh, extrapolate a little bit. Uh, and the reason we can do that is because we can tie it to past data. Look, I think today was Gladiators like pretty much at their worst, right? Uh, look, generally they've got better at avoiding poor performances but like they have had poor performances, right? They've also got better at uh, playing well when it counts most. I think that's what we saw a lot along stage two. Uh, but like this is a team just kind of plagued by consistency issues, right? Like I, I don't know how else to put that. Like th- I think this is just one of those times where like the consistency was was poor enough to amount to a loss. I don't think it's because they're suddenly on this decline and they're going to have this dizzying free fall through the standings. I just think this is. Uh, the ugliest 
that this issue has reared its ugly head at. And I think the important thing to note about that, like it, it, there's almost a, a duality between between this and what I said about the soul, only it sort of manifests in a slightly different way in that, um, you know, I, I don't I don't care how well you did in stage two. I don't care how poorly you did in stage I don't care where you finish in the standings at any given point if you can't pull it off again, right? It, it really doesn't matter. And, and uh, if they do pull themselves back now and have you know, another fifth place finish or even push the envelope beyond that, we're still going to look at this and go, well, then why the hell did they lose to Shark? And that's still a problem, you know, and until it, it sounds really dumb, until it stops being a problem, it's a problem. Until the consistency is fin- like f- completely fixed, and I don't just mean as in like, we got more consistent across stage two, until it's completely fixed, I I can't look at this team and and you know, really tout them too much. I think they are an extremely good team. Don't get me wrong. I think they absolutely deserve every finish they've ever had. Um, you know, the, the wins they've had have been good, hard-fought wins. The losses they've had have been completely fair enough. Um, but I, I just, I can't get too excited about, about Gladiators right now. I also can't look at it and say, yeah, I see them totally bottoming out. What I think we may see is compared to season, uh, stage two, rather, which I would call being a consistency peak for Gladiators, we may see them entering a bit of a consistency trough. Uh, first of all, we don't know that for sure. They'll have to pick up a few more losses in order for that to be considered to be the case. And also, we can only consider it to be a trough if they then start going back on the rise after that. So we're not going to know that for sure until probably stage four. But that is kind of the trajectory of this team. And this is not a team I see really fixing their stuff you know, before the end of the year, unfortunate as that is to say, because we're halfway through the first season of Overwatch League now. Consistency is a huge issue for this team. And the fact that it is now at its worst at the halfway mark, I, I just don't think there's enough time to really turn that around significantly. Shock, on the other hand, do seem to have turned a corner today. It's one thing for Gladiators to look poor and have a bad game. In the past, they've still beaten most of those lower standing teams in spite of that. It has to be said that it's another thing entirely for Shock to exploit Gladiators, where in the past they failed to. This is a good sign for the Shock. But there are two things to note here. And you said having a longer episode today, so, you know, buckle <laughs> in. I've still got a ways to go on this one. Two things to note. First of all, the rest of the lower half of the standings are also looking to turn things around. And I mentioned this a little bit earlier uh, with regards to Valiant. So, look... Shock may have only improved in line with the competition. They could still end up finishing bottom four, right? Like, it may not be enough to to amount to a legitimate rise in the standings, unfortunately. Secondly, uh, as I noticed as well when discussing Shanghai versus Dallas, the rest of the bottom four are no teams to sleep on. And, you know, I was talking about it more with regards to fuel. You know, the moment, the moment you are sort of taking those losses where maybe you feel you should have been having wins, like the moment... There is no, well, I'll never finish last because of this other team. The moment that's not the case, a lot of these teams have to really uh, look look hard, look inwardly. I think Shock have actually done that to a decent extent um, compared to some of these other teams that have sort of bounced around the bottom a little bit. I'd, I'd say Mayhem have as well. We also saw that reflected with Mayhem in, in the last stage. Uh, but on the whole, if today isn't the start of a meteoric, meteoric rise for Shock, but it is the start of one for say dragons then like shock is still going to find themselves in the bottom four as harsh as that is to say improvements don't happen in a vacuum um it's not enough to just fix past issues every team is fixing past issues you have to push fully beyond what your team was capable of previously and i'm not certain shock can do that it doesn't mean to say i think they won't or i think they can't i'm really just not sure today really hasn't been enough to extrapolate from in that regard but as always, time will tell. And the shock are they're they're a bottle of talent, a bit young talent, right? Besides, you know, Dak and and, and yeah. Nomi, uh, who we're actually going to have on the show tomorrow, so that's going to be cool. Yeah. Uh, if anything, based off that, I would maybe now start putting them in that box that I used to put Philadelphia in, and like, okay, now I'm looking at a team that's got you know potentially quite a high ceiling and could take a bit of time to realize that and then sort of suddenly spring onto that meteoric rise. They're playing a long game here. You don't pick yeah. up a bunch of 16, 17, and 18-year-old players to make a run at the championship when none of them have even played together. So Yeah, and I think I think that's the shock looking at their past two bottom four performances and going, yeah, look, this isn't working. We've got to change tack here. And it can't just be a, you know, 
a purchase GC Busan kind of thing, right? Like that's just not an option for any of these teams anymore. So look, if you're not in that top four, if you're not already kind of pushing that envelope, uh, and, you know, especially if you're sort of in that bottom four, you've, you've got to start playing that long game. And and I like that Shock have done that. Like I said, I think they've they've actually already started facing what I would say the Fuel are already just starting to face in this stage. Awesome. Well, Pixie, uh, I'm going to let you go. <laughs> Thanks so much for, for joining me. Analyzing yesterday's episode, make sure to follow Pixie on Twitter at Pixie on the mic and you can ca- catch him casting. What are you casting these days now? You're casting. Uh, I'm, I'm casting uh, Contenders Pacific and uh, on occasion Contenders Australia as well. Uh, so you'll catch me Contenders Pacific uh, every week on, depending on what your times it is, Thursday nights and Saturday nights. I think some people that maybe works out to like the very early AMs on a Thursday or something like that, but that's when you'll find me. Awesome. Thanks again, Pixie. My thanks to Pixie for stopping by. Make sure to follow him on Twitter at Pixie on the mic. And I'm going to be joined tomorrow by San Francisco Shock players, Dak and Nomi. We've got a wide variety of San Francisco Shock topics we're going to discuss Uh, If you like the show, make sure to follow, like, subscribe, wherever you're listening or watching. Thank you again uh, for tuning in. I'm going to be back tomorrow with Dak and Nomi for another episode of Overwatch League Daily.